Hi, and welcome to episode 9 of the Western Canon Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Alexander Hill, and today we'll be talking about Plato and his Republic. Alright, so this will be the first in a series of three episodes on Plato's Republic. In this first episode, I'm bringing two guest experts on the show to discuss this great work. The first guest is Dr. Nathan Schluter. Dr. Schluter is a professor at Hillsdale College. Hillsdale is actually one of the great colleges that we have reviewed in our Guide to Great Books Colleges, and I've been wanting to have him on the show for quite some time. And our second guest, Spencer Clavin, will be joining us later to discuss Plato's influence on Christianity. We'll be focusing mostly on Plato's thoughts in the Republic, specifically with respect to how these ideas became important in the later development of the Christian religion. Plato's Republic is a Socratic dialogue, written by Plato at around 380 BC. The focus of Plato's work is on justice. What would a just city-state look like? What does a just man look like? But this important work also touches on a broad variety of other themes, like metaphysics, knowledge, truth, the soul, immortality, the role of the philosopher, education, poetry, and there are many other uh, fascinating topics discussed as well. The Republic is easily Plato's best-known work, and it has proven to be one of the most influential works in the Western canon. So in this episode, we'll talk to a couple of experts and do a cursory introduction to Plato's Republic to the question of why Plato matters, how he has impacted religion, and why we need this philosopher now more than ever. In my next episode, episode 10, Plato's Republic Part 2, I'll go in-depth on the great ideas in the Republic. So I'll do my best to outline uh, and make intelligible some of Plato's uh, more difficult and abstract ideas. Um, We'll talk about Plato's demolition of moral relativism, his allegory of the cave, his theory of the forms. We'll talk about his tripartite theory of the soul and the city-state. We'll even go into the Ring of Gyges uh, and and more topics. And so we'll take an up-close look at these deep ideas. Um, And also next episode, we'll have part two of the Liberty Lounge, where we'll examine the second half of Thomas G. West's great book, The Political Theory of the American Founding. Uh, It'll really be helpful, um, if you're going to listen to that, to, to go back and listen to part one of my review of the political theory of the American founding. Uh, what I'm doing here is more than just a review. I'm actually examining the ideas in the book. And and really, if you listen to part one, it's a good overview of the founders' uh, political theory of their, of their philosophy of natural rights um, and of ordered liberty. We'll also do next episode part two of our Guide to Great Books Colleges. And so, of course, there we'll look at three awesome uh, new Great Books Colleges that we didn't touch on in the first episode. All right. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first guest, a man whom I've wanted to have on the show for quite some time, Dr. Nathan Schluter. I first heard Dr. Schluter on the National Review podcast, where he was discussing Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, sort of a left-wing dystopia. Um, Nathan Schluter is a professor of philosophy and religion at Hillsdale College, where he directs the pre-law program and also teaches courses in social and political philosophy, ethical theory, and also literature. He is a recipient of Hillsdale College's Doherty Award for Teaching Excellence. Nathan has a BA in history from Miami University of Ohio and an MA and a PhD in politics from the University of Dallas. Nathan is the author of One Dream or Two, Justice in America and in the Thought of Martin Luther King Jr. That's Lexington Books, 2002. He also authored uh, The Humane Vision of Wendell Berry, edited with Mark Mitchell, Okay, that's ISI Books, 2011, and he was co-author with Nikolai Wenzel of Selfish Libertarians and Socialist Conservatives, The Foundation of the Libertarian Conservative Debate, Stanford University Press, 2017. Dr. Schluter's articles have appeared in First Things Magazine, Touchstone, Logos, Communio, Public Discourse, and Perspectives in Political Science. 
Nathan has been a fellow of the National Endowment for the Humanities, 2005, and Princeton University, 2011. He is currently working on his next book, Playing with Fire, The Peril and Promise of the Utopian Imagination. He and his wife, Elizabeth, who is a homemaker and homeschooler, have eight children. All right, let's get him on the show. Hi, Dr. Schluter. Thanks for taking the time. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. So you're a professor of philosophy and religion at Hillsdale College. I've been wanting to have someone from Hillsdale College on the podcast for a while now. I've always been fascinated uh, by the place. I read an article, a long article in the New York Times about Hillsdale College, and uh, it's, it's a place that's been on my radar for a while. So tell me briefly before we get into Plato, what brought you to, to Hillsdale College um, and, and what's it like to teach there? And maybe, maybe then you could also tell me um, while you're at it, uh, what, what area of philosophy do you specialize in and, and what are the sorts of courses you teach at Hillsdale? So I'll, I'll give you the abridged story there. I went to graduate school because I was, I had large interests. I was interested in literature. I was interested in politics. I was interested in philosophy. I was interested in theology and I was interested on how, and how all of those are connected to one another. And so that's what I looked for in graduate school. And the only graduate school that existed at the time that offered that kind, an education for that kind of interest was the University of Dallas which has a PhD program in literature, politics, and philosophy, and the different disciplines all take core classes together, uh, structured around the great books. So that's why I went to graduate school, and that's what I was looking for in a teaching position. And Hillsdale is one of the few small liberal arts colleges that still offers what at one time I think was a standard kind of education with a core curriculum, a, a, mandate, a, a sort of prescriptive core curriculum organized around uh, great texts and one which constantly sort of sought to promote conversation across the disciplines towards great questions that all those disciplines share. So I'm very grateful to be at Hillsdale, to be at a school which still takes that kind of education seriously, and I'm surrounded by colleagues that I admire and respect who share my interests and are very bright, bringing their own specialized knowledge to those questions. I learn so much from them, and I'm surrounded by great students, and I tell the students on the first day of class, my freshman, you're smarter than me, you're just ignorant, <laughs> which, is not, which is not meant to be an insult to them. It's meant to kind of inspire them. They're really, really smart kids, and they know that they don't know enough yet, but they're really eager to learn. Right. And so it's really a delight to be, to be in that position to help them. And um, so that's what it's like to be here. It's, it's really... I feel like it's a place that really reinforces my vocation. Yeah, so uh, one thing I wanted to touch on there, there's this um, attitude, I think, that's prevalent right now. It's it's something I've talked about with my colleagues, and, and some of my colleagues have this notion that, um, th they say this all the time, students learn differently. Students learn differently now. They learn differently now. And my response is always, well, students have different tools that they use to learn now, but I actually don't think that very much about human nature has changed in the last hundred years. Um, so is there something special about the way the sort of the great books, primary source, um, Socratic method that you guys use at Hillsdale College? Do you think that that is still in the, in the 21st century a relevant and important way to teach? It's a great question and obviously a big question. I do think that the change in technologies for delivering education have been very consequential. There's still a lot of questioning about the effectiveness of those way, forms of learning. I'm inclined to think that more traditional ways of delivering an education, increasingly it's, it's becoming clear that you just can't really replace 
the intimate personal contact that goes on in the yeah. classroom and that you cannot really replace the kind of furnishing of the mind that can occur by encountering great minds through great books. So another thing I tell my students on the first day of class is I'm not your teacher in this semester. And they look at me with kind of open <laughs> eyes. What, what do you mean? Am I in the wrong section? Poor freshmen. <laughs> Sometimes they are. <laughs> but, uh, no, your teachers are going to be Plato and Aristotle and Shakespeare oh, that's and great. Dante and others. Uh, I'm just your tour guide, really. Uh, I, it would be presumptuous of me to think that I can teach you better than they can, but what I can do after a long experience with these great minds is to show you, show you how to notice things, how to pay attention to things, and to learn yourself, to be able to teach yourself. I, I'm platonic in this respect, that I see education not as putting ideas into an empty mind, right. but as turning the soul towards the true, the good, and the beautiful. There's a turning process that happens that's very intimate and interior in particular to each student. And so they have to go through that process, each one for him or herself. Now, I will say this, though, that Hillsdale's a little different than some other schools. On, on, one, on one side of the spectrum, you have something like a St. John's College in which it's a very uniform, very rigorous seminar style education in which um, the role of the tutor is is really minimized the tutor really is meant to be just a facilitator with each individual's encounter with that text and Hillsdale is not quite like that we leave a lot more room for the teacher to play to his or her strengths so that's great um, so some are more comfortable with with lecturing, giving context, background, some are more comfortable with sitting sitting down in a seminar room and just forcing the students to wrestle all alone with what's going on in the text. And some do something that's a little more in between those two. And I guess that's my style. I think it's really important for them to have context. They do need human nature being what it is, in my view. Those books are not... Uh, you, you can't just abstract them and insulate them from the whole context, historical and even literary context in which they exist. So I try to give a lot of context Great. while also encouraging their own reflection and engagement with it. Fantastic. I agree with that. And that's very inspiring. Actually, watching some of those Hillsdale videos, the good, the beautiful and the true were very inspiring. Right. I just featured Hillsdale in a we're doing a guide to great books colleges. And so I spent about 15 minutes talking about Hillsdale. I want to get to Plato. Uh, so as you know, we're just getting started doing our episodes on Plato with you. I'd like to hone in on Plato's Republic. So the Republic is uh, Plato's major philosophical work. It's his attempt to describe what the ideal state would be like. But I think, for me, the, the Republic is kind of an astonishing book for the ideas that it explores. Um, the Republic just asks so many important questions. You know, what is justice? What is knowledge? What's the best form of government? How should citizens be educated? Are men equal? Why do we have to obey laws? Uh, you know, do different people have different roles in society, etc. I always love revisiting Plato's allegory of the cave, his myth of the metals, the tripartite theory of the soul and state. And so I'm convinced that the Republic is a great work of Western literature. But from an expert, I, I'd like to know, why should we still be reading Plato's Republic? Why, why should my students, for example, read uh, Plato's Republic? You've done a nice job hitting many of the reasons I'm I'm partial, I suppose, but partial for reasons. I think Plato's Republic, in some sense, rules the entire Western philosophical tradition, um, maybe alongside, a, a few steps below, if you will, the Bible, which is the book, right? It's right. hard to beat the book. <laughs> uh, but uh, setting, a, setting aside the book just for a moment... Uh, Plato's Republic, I think, has to come in there as the monumental work of, of, of our tradition. And the, part of the reason is 
uh, not just because of all of the things that you mentioned, which I think are so richly there, but because of the way in which it integrates those things. So the Republic slowly and carefully unfolds for the reader the connection. What, why it, 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 it sort of begins with a very practical, uh, down-to-earth set of problems. That's where it starts. And what that people can acknowledge or recognize as in some way parallel to the conversations they might have mm. uh, over a Thanksgiving turkey or whatever else. Um, th th those very basic conversations begin, but as they go under the guidance of Socrates, we are brought into the sort of deepest human questions where metaphysics and ethics and aesthetics and politics are all being drawn upon and connected. And so it's, it's, it's the great book because it's not just about one thing. Plato's dialogues tend to be each one focused on one particular topic. What is virtue? What is love? Right. It takes these different questions. But the question, what is justice, somehow in, uh, unpacking that unfolds all these other questions. I also think it's just a radically relevant book. It's so timely in so many ways. There's this view out there that dead white males are locked into their own particular time and place and gender and race and whatever else that we're all locked into these categories. Yeah, there's a very sectional, that, sectional, intersectional, uh, fragmenting sort of moralism going on right now. Exactly, and and it's partly why the great books aren't studied anymore because of the because of that ideology. Well, they're designed to lift us out of that tribalism. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's exactly right. I mean, they are they are the thing that did that. The the discovery of nature, if you will, was the precondition for being able to transcend uh, the things that we see as obstacles today. So what we're seeing today, strangely, in attacking the Western civilization, made possible really by the West, is a return to a tribalism. But in the Republic, so radically, you, you get, I think, the most radical defense, for example, of feminism beyond what was imagined even until True. the 20th century True. and you get a severe <laughs> critique of aristocracy by birth you get yeah. a severe critique of paternalism this we're talking fifth century bc here fourth yeah. fifth century bc the he, plato is showing us the possibilities for these claims of justice he's also showing us i think the difficulties in, ma in making those things your focal point of justice. So he's reminding us what the obstacles are in human nature to achieving, if you will, if, if those things, achieving perfect justice. So this book is sometimes considered to be a work of, maybe the first work of utopian fiction. And it's sometimes accused of eliciting utopian longings and desire which inevitably become dystopian longings and desire because once you start longing for a perfect political regime on earth and you start really wanting that to happen uh that can encourage cruelty and violence in order to achieve that ideal so the republic is sometimes associated with those things but i think what it actually is is a therapy for utopian longing it both shows us the roots of utopian longing, but then shows us what would have to be done to realize this. And so it ends up remind, I think, being a kind of stern warning against utopianism, precisely by doing that, not by preventing us from seeing th those ideals out there, by showing us what those are, but by showing us also what it is in human nature that makes those ideals impossible and possibly even dangerous so i read it actually as an anti-utopian work of fiction and I, you know and i called it an, a work of fiction there i think that's really notable why is that yeah so this to me is really important why 
is it that Plato only writes dialogues? Mm. And what is a dialogue? It's striking to compare, and my students do, compare the style of Plato to Aristotle, for example. And Aristotle is writing treatises. They read like academic lectures right. that students are maybe more accustomed to. Whereas from the get-go in, in, in Plato's dialogues, you get a list of dramatis personae, you know, the, the, these persons of the drama, mm -hmm. and you get then those persons uh, in conversation with often a setting and an action. They're in a particular place or in a particular time. A question is raised. They're referring to previous events. The, the text itself reads like a work of fiction. And that raises great questions. Like, why does Plato r embed his philosophy in fiction if that's what he's doing? And that is actually a cue, it seems to me, that we need to pay close attention to it as a work of fiction. That is, we need to pay attention to the characters, to the drama, to the conversation, the historical context. Mm. And we're warned then, I think, not to simply l try to lift the philosophical claims abstractly out of the text and to universalize them and make them a kind of Platonism. Gotcha. Which is really what I think Neoplatonism does. Hmm. When you get into the Neoplatonic period, Platonism has become hardened into a whole metaphysical picture, whereas in the dialogues themselves, that picture is presented much more playfully, hmm. much more contingently, much more speculatively, with an attention to actual human beings who are trying right. to understand this. And so I think it's really important to recover Plato as, as philosophical literature, if you will. Uh, and that's how we read it in my class. We're, we're very attentive from the get-go. I mean, the, the, the characters in the first book of Plato's Republic are so colorful. That they're delineated with so much color. Mm -hmm. you, get, you get Cephalus, the old man, who's coming in from the sacrifices with a wreath on his head, <laughs> and he's talking about how difficult old age is, right. and they have this wonderful conversation about aging, and then you get his son who jumps into the conversation, and Cephalus leaves, and his son, there's a little bit of anxiety about this question of justice because he's the one who's inheriting the wealth, and he's a little worried about whether his wealth is justified. And they have this conversation. And then, of course, this character Thrasymachus <laughs> comes in and he's described like a lion, like a wild beast. <laughs> and everyone's holding him back. And he's listening very impatiently. Undergraduates can imagine this. Right. Some right. of them are like <laughs> this. So yeah. I said, you, you've had your late night dorm room conversations. Do you know any Thrasymachuses? Yeah. Some of them blush because they are the Thrasymachus. They can't patiently sit in a conversation when they hear things that they think are ridiculous. They're just so eager to jump in and assert what they know to be true. And they want to be heard. And they think they've got the answer. So Thrasymachus right. jumps in like a wild beast. And we all know people like this. Oh, I'm it's like hard. that. I told my yeah. students this because we're, we're we're not up to the Republic yet in my philosophy class. Uh, we started with ethics, and so now we're we're using uh, Socrates and Plato to get to launch us into metaphysics. So we're about to do the Republic. But I was teaching hey. them the Socratic method, and uh, I was just trying to describe the patience that it takes to be Socrates to use like reductio ad absurdum and to ask these narrowing, these gradual narrowing questions that eventually befuddle uh, your interlocutor. And I said, I can't do it because I want I want to prove my opponent wrong by saying something right. affirmative right away. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a that's a great self observation and I share it. It's 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 it, it, it's my own self knowledge as well as a teacher, because Socrates is a consummate teacher. Yeah. And what he knows he needs to do is get Thrasymachus in a place where he will shut up and listen. Mm-hmm. And so he doesn't just start off giving a discourse on justice. He lets Thrasymachus do that. And so Thrasymachus thinks he knows, and he begins to sort of ask questions of Thrasymachus. And it turns out Thrasymachus can't really give a coherent account of the thing that he 
thinks is justice. So can you frame that de- that debate that they have? What th- that's a very famous moment in the Republic, and it comes early on. What are they What are they wrestling about? So Thersimachus jumps in. Uh, there's a, there's a prior argument about uh, what, what is justice, and Socrates uh, wants to initially show. Initially, Cephalus says, Cephalus or Cephalus, depending on which pronunciation you want to, want to use, argues that justice is telling the truth and giving back what one owes. Right. And so Socrates locks in on to giving back what one owes, and he says, well, what does that mean exactly? Uh, so does that mean that if you give someone a weapon, someone's entrusted with a weapon, and they... S- come back asking for the weapon and you know that they're planning to do harm or violence with that weapon are you obliged to give it back to them? Right. and it's a famous kind of question and that's precisely the point where Keflis says uh, no I don't think so and so Socrates says what's, so giving back what one owes can't be just giving back what people have and by the way that's a funny moment with my Hillsdale students who are to come in pretty committed to pop- property rights and to the Second Amendment. Right. And I tell them, okay, Socrates has just uh, gotten you to rethink <laughs> to some degree what it means to have a right to private property and especially your weapons. Sure. Because he's just, how many of you, and I ask him this every year, if your friend borrows a gun from you and then he, uh, your friend loans you his gun and then he comes back and he's just out of his mind and he says give me my gun back I'm going to go shoot someone Do you, are you obliged to give him a gun back and not one in ten years has said yes Right. but I say it's his gun right you know look what you it's his property number one and it's his gun number two you don't think so why not why are you so and, and, and so that leads you to think that property rights and weapons might be contingent upon having a certain kind of knowledge and moral virtue and responsibility. Sure. And suddenly that becomes kind of a dangerous question mm. because, wow, how are we to measure that? How are we to evaluate who is responsible enough or wise enough or virtuous enough to have, possess property, especially weapons? You know, so that set of unresolved questions. So Thrasymachus is getting fierce. Now, Thrasymachus... Um, by the question he asks, what he comes in is he says, "You guys are all just." This is typical of Socrates. He asks questions. He doesn't say what justice is. He's very frustrated. He's one of these people who likes clear answers, and, and so many people are like this, right? right? Why am I why am I reading this book, asking all these questions without telling me what to think? I just want <laughs> yeah. a neat black and white answer. But he thinks he's got the answer, and he says, "I'll tell you what it is, but you're going to have to pay me." Which is striking, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's a kind of clue for classicists that Thersimachus is a sophist. sophist. Yeah. Which means that he is a professional teacher who takes money to educate young men about how to succeed in politics. Right. How to use rhetoric to 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 uh, to gain power, basically. Exactly. Particularly to use rhetoric. And so Socrates is just so brilliant, right? He says, I don't have any money. Because <laughs> um, he doesn't value money. He values wisdom. So his friends say, we'll pitch in, we'll pay if he can give a good account. So go ahead, Thrasymachus. And so Thrasymachus gives his definition in which he simply says, justice is the advantage of the stronger. Right. That's all it is. It's the advantage of the stronger. And so Socrates goes through some uh, gymnastics, one of them being, there are several, but one of them just obviously being, well, what if... uh, So this is might makes right, correct? Well, that's the argument he makes, that's right. Might makes right. Socrates asks the question, well, what if the person with might doesn't know, makes a mistake about about his advantage? Right. What if you think something's his advantage, but it really isn't? And Thrasymachus, you know, goes through his set of answers. He replies to this, but it, if you, if I always ask my students to outline the argument, what what are the premises? What 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 are the problems with the argument that Socrates is bringing up? 
and it turns out it's it gets kind of convoluted and the thing that Thrasymachus cannot let go of is that he's an expert in his art of rhetoric and he's also an expert in but given his definition knowing his own advantage and these two kinds of knowledge end up being intention so what I want to say here to you, which is important, is that Socrates in his arguments with Thrasymachus is not entirely fair. What he wants to do is to get Thrasymachus to just kind of be quiet for a moment, to at least come to a place where he says, I don't really know. I don't right. know the answer. Right. It's, it's more complicated than I thought. So he uses some strategies that are that to the students look very sophistic actually that they look like the kind of thing a sophist would do and at the end of that thrasymachus blushes which is a brilliant little move it says you know i saw something i never saw before thrasymachus blushed just one line and i say to my students what a brilliant line yeah what does what does it mean to blush nietzsche describes defines man at a certain point as the beast with red cheeks or you know that's not the conventional definition of man but what does it take to blush right it takes a conscience at least in part it takes a kind of awareness a sh sense of shame the sorts of things no other animal blushes only man blushes right. and it means that he has reason in some f sense and his reason can be corrected. Anyhow, Thrasymachus, he gets Thrasymachus to be quiet. But at the, at the end of book one, Socrates says, I was a glutton. I just sort of went after all the desserts here. I jumped at all these arguments and made them, but I don't really quite know if I believe them. And I'm really not any further along in knowing what justice is than when I began. And so you, you get the sense at the end of book one that it's been a kind of brilliant car crash. Um, it's, it's had all these fireworks in it and th th there's been these moments of brilliant insight but at the end of it what have we accomplished? Well he did he did knock down a pretty scary argument the idea that might makes right and then he, as you pointed out he says that basically you know those in power can make mistakes and if if they can make mistakes they can make laws that are not in their own interest and right. to obey those laws is not to act in the interest interest of those in power, and then he, you know, thus to be just is to do what is in the interest of those in power, and to be just is to do what is not in the interest of those. So you're right; it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. He he hits these various contradictions in Thrasymachus, but but the striking thing is, it seems to me that <clears throat> at the at the very beginning of book two, then book one could have just ended the Republic, right. But at book two, Socrates is, is, is with this guy named um, Glaucon at the beginning of the Republic. Mm. Again, he and Glaucon go down to the Piraeus, which is this port city in Athens, where there's a new festival. It's just a brilliant setting. Every detail matters. And I, I won't go into that, but you know, it's something your, your listeners should know. Every detail is just saturated with meaning in this book. Mm. So he's with Glaucon at the beginning, and Glaucon comes in at the beginning of book two and he says socrates do you do you really want to persuade us or do you just want to seem to have persuaded us and socrates says well i really want to persuade you and glaucon then shows why he is the deeper thinker than thrasymachus because he says well thrasymachus he didn't make the argument very well but he's got a really good point i i, I hear all these people say that tyranny really is the best thing like if if you could really get everything you desired, you know, all the women, all the money, all the power, everyone really would want that. The only reason they don't pursue it is because they might get found out. Right. You know, they they might get ashamed. You know, if, if they could do this without being discovered, deep down, that's what people would want. And so he goes through the arguments that I'm sure you know, using say the Ring of God. Ring of God, Jesus, right? yeah. This, again, this sort of brilliant little imaginative device for getting us to sort of deeply understand human nature. If you could have an invisibility ring, how would you act? Right. And I kind of wink at my students. Did you ever hear of an invisibility ring? Wink, wink. 
Uh, yeah, they all all my students at least at Hillsdale are big Tolkien fans, right, so right. they they immediately make that connection. I say, oh, it's interesting, right? Mm. But there's, uh, Glaucon presents the a, a just amazing defense of tyranny, and then his brother jumps in, and and, and complements that by by adding various things to it, so that at the end, Socrates, boy, he say, he says after he hears them, boy, you guys. I'm surprised you're not tyrants. You've made such a good argument. You must have really good character to see how persuasive the case is for tyranny, but to not be pursuing it. But these are really important arguments. <laughs> I don't know really how to defend myself perfectly, but it would be impious of me not to try. Which I think is a striking choice of words. Because if you remember, Socrates is put to death for impiety by the city of Athens. Right. And that's sort of the singular event that haunts the entire dialogue. It's written after the death of Socrates, but it's set before his death. Mm. And what Plato seems to be saying is, Socrates did not corrupt Athens. Right. Athens was already in bad shape. They were already inviting these foreign gods in, and look at Thrasymachus, and the defense he's making of justice as might makes right, and then look at what even good people like Glaucon are making because they're hearing it from everyone else. Right. That is, you get a very, you've got a very dangerous ideology that's already permeating Athenian culture. And Socrates says it would be impious of me not to come to the defense of justice. So it seems to me very likely that Plato's Republic is really. Plato's true defense of Socrates, not the f- defense he's forced to give in front of the Athenian assembly, where he's just awkward. Right, right. He, ju- he just, it's not his way of conversing. He doesn't think the sort of compelled sorts of witness arguments that you get in a law court are the sorts of venues in which truth, time, in any deep sense can be done. Gotcha, yeah. And so Plato's apology is really uh, interesting in lots of other ways. But not because you're getting Socrates, Plato's deepest defense and understanding of who Socrates is. So, so well, that one of the things the whole rest of the Republic. Yeah, one of the things that I love about the Apology, if I remember, it's been a really long time, but uh, and I could have this wrong. But I remember there there being some kind of defense uh, on the part of Socrates where he says something like, "The philosopher should have the right to put things out there." That there's a sense in which um, it's actually really important to be able to put put ideas out there to test them out uh, and and ping pong them off someone else to try to figure out what's true. Do I have that anywhere near right? <laughs> well, yeah, that may be there. Um, what, what stands out to me in his defense is that it, it, again, it's rooted in this very particular story. Someone. You, he, someone hears a rumor that Socrates is the wisest Athenian, mm. and he doesn't believe it. He's like, that can't be true. I see all these other people that are wise. And so uh, this person goes to consult the oracle at Delphi. And the oracle says, you know, Socrates is the wisest. Right. So he uh, decides to test that oracle. And so he goes around to test what people know. And what he discovers is that... Uh, he doesn't know anything more than they do, but they really think they know things, <laughs> whereas he kind of knows what he doesn't know. Right. And questioning people's presumption to knowledge is deeply offensive to them. Right. And especially the claim that they know what virtue is, that they know how to live well. I think it's important to see in a way that that there is a way in which Socrates is questioning has a subversive quality to it. I mean, it, it seems to me that um, w- one can argue that at least to some degree, um, peop- a, a political regime requires people who are attached to that regime. The, the, it requires people who, patriotism, you know, if Americans are going to die for America, they need to be attached to America. They, they need to see things there that they are willing to die for. Mm-hmm. And, so you have to be careful about 
getting them to become just philosophics, you know, philosophically speculative about, well, you know, maybe, uh, you know, all these attachments are not really grounded in the truth, but in something very particular that's not universal. True. And, uh-huh. and, and so, I mean, here, here's where we could, you know, jump to the allegory of the cave just for a moment, because the allegory of the cave is is the very heart and center of the dialogue to a certain degree. And th- that allegory is often presented in purely sort of pedagogical terms, right? You've got these, right. you move from sort of shadows of things to things in themselves, uh, to, to the ideas of the things, to the idea of the good, and education sort of turning and working through these. But I think the really important thing to see in that allegory is that the cave is... A city it's 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 a political regime right, right. if you think about it as a political regime and, and there are all kinds of hints that it's a political regime and the and, and and when Socrates leaves and gets outside the cave in the allegory and then he has to go back in uh, which is itself kind of an interesting question why does he have to go back in but he goes back in and he starts telling the people about what he's seen on the outside and, and they tell him be quiet right um, um, shut up, and if you keep talking, we're going to kill you. <clears throat> now, these are the people that are in ch- are chained up, looking at the wall of the cave, and they can't break the chains. It's just it's very unclear from the allegory of the cave that they they can remove themselves from the situation which they're in. How does Socrates get out? It says if by some chance, you know, his, that his chains were broken, and he was compelled to turn around. Wow. Right. But we're not told what breaks the chain. We're not told who or what compels him to turn around. And the very first experience he has when he turns around is painful because he's going from a kind of light into a darkness. And that's painful to go from light to darkness. What is it in our nature that resists? I think we all know, right? None of us likes to be turned from light to darkness. And then he makes the ascent. And he goes from darkness into light, where he sees the fire uh, at, at the level, at the next level. There's mm-hmm. a fire mm-hmm. there where there's this various puppeteers. That hurts his eyes. It takes some accustoming, some getting accustomed to the light. And then there are these people who, wow, these are the people casting the images onto the wall of the cave. So we see that what the people chained are seeing is not really anything but the images being cast by the image makers. Right. And, and the question is, who are these image makers? Now, that's a great question. So can I ask you there? Um, yeah. I, I see where you're going with this, and, and this is great because a lot. I think I, what you said was a lot of teachers teach this as a way of talking about metaphysics, right? The idea that, you know... Um, what you see is sort of this Kantian idea that what you see is is not really the thing in itself, right? You're filtering the world through your narrow subjectivity and that there's a real truth out there and then you can start talking about the forms and all of that. Um, right. You're extending that out to, and, and this is what you think um, Plato was really talking about, uh, to the political realm, to, Absolutely. to the to the state. Um, t- tell me about what Plato's allegory of the cave uh, what is what does that allegory mean politically for us? So that is the great. That this is just one of the many, just stunning images, allegories, parts of Plato's Republic that in itself could become a subject of years of reflection and meditation. Mm-hmm. So, so, so let me just say this: that this is just one of the beautiful things about Plato's Republic that. The way learning, real learning happens is not just confinable to a simple definition, that there's sort of inexhaustible depths and that the imagination, in fact, can do a lot of work for philosophy. Right. Plato is an incredibly imaginative philosopher. We drive a wedge between the imagination, say the humanities on one side or something, and then philosophy, which is all about reason. But Plato refuses to do that. Mm. He sees that the imagination and reason are very closely allied. So here's an image that uh, in the image does a kind of work that would be very difficult to do independent of the image. So to, then to get to your question, I think what seems to be going on here um, is that 
uh, s- several claims seem to be embedded in the image. One of them is that uh, hu- human beings are stratified in a certain way in terms of what they know, what they can't know. That is, they're, they're, they're unequal in a certain way. They, mm-hmm. uh, and they always will be. And political life in particular is, is, cannot be then rooted in knowledge per se. It can't simply be based upon metaphysical insight of citizens. That human knowledge, for the most part, begins with very concrete, particular experiences that are embedded, frankly, first and foremost, in the stories we hear. That it's the narratives and stories that begin to structure our knowledge. The mythos. The muthos, it's exactly right, which just pervades the Republic. The the whole Republic is really about mythos and logos and how they're related to one another. And we we can talk about that more later, but if if, if there's time. But so so the algo of the cave seems to be um, that opinion or muthos is fundamental to political life. Every political regime has a story it tells about itself. And but here's the other thing to notice about it. It's not this is not a postmodern account, even though it's focusing on narrative, right? right. Because there is a meta narrative. Right. The meta narrative is outside the cave. You can get out there. Gotcha. Yep. But 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 you can't build the city on the meta narrative. Right. W- what you're going to have to do is take that meta narrative outside the cave. You know, ask my students what what do you th- if you want to change those people in the chains in the cave. You want to free them. You want to liberate them. I can see two different models. Uh, one model is to go down and just uh, just make hell down there, break <laughs> up the chains, bring on a bat, you know, smash the wall. And will that work? No. <laughs> right? uh, it's it's like Solzhenitsyn said: the line between good and evil runs through every human heart, yeah. or something like that. Like until you change right. human nature, those chains aren't going to do anything. Those chains are in your nature. They're, what do you need? In, really in, in Christianity, they call that soteriology, right? What you need is <laughs> soteriology, right? Abs- absolutely, absolutely. Which is a work of grace in Christianity. Yeah. It's not so unless you're a Pelagian, you can't just do this yourself. You yeah. can't just pick yourself up and turn yourself around. But there's a second option. You that you, that doesn't mean you just have to leave people uh, bound to their chains, indifferent, because you got those image makers up there in that next level. Mm. And who are those guys? Those guys, well, at, at some superficial level, uh, well, they're advertisers, right? Mm. We all know who the image makers are. Just watch us. Just watch some football today. Yeah. Watch the commercials. Yeah. Don't yeah. tell me there aren't <laughs> image makers. Yeah. Don't tell me there aren't whole departments, you know, disciplines and colleges and universities dedicated to image making. Yes. Why? To exert power over people. Yeah. To get them to desire and choose the things you want. So let's not pretend Plato's like. You know, trying to uh, do anything that we don't already do today. Mm-hmm. But if if we concede that advertising departments have a kind of power, then we better just be frank about this: that that so much of our political lives, our moral lives, our say commercial economic lives are framed by images, and then it becomes hugely important what kinds of images we are being given that's right and is it not the case and i think it clearly is the case that some images come closer to being outside the cave mm-hmm. than others mm-hmm. so not all images are created equal to uh, make a turn of phrase in the declaration of independence um so presumably what the people outside the cave can do they can go in and, and you know break up the whole thing and that's what you have in the french revolution Right. I think exactly. You break all the chains. You create chaos. Uh, another option is to become a great image maker. To work at the level level of images. What images can I cast upon this wall that are going to do the most to liberate those people in chains? To see in and through the image towards something like what's outside the cave. How can I draw them out as far as possible through the image? So what I tell my students is not all caves are created equal. You know, if every political regime is a cave, not all caves are equally cave-like. Right. 
because the muthos of the cave can have more or less logos in it. Right. And my view is that America is a is a is a, is a muthos that's deeply permeated by logos. Right. That is, we have a muthos which tells us there's a logos. Yeah, and, and you can't a, get to the logos without the mythos. Per, precisely. That is exactly it. But what a claim to make, right? Right. What 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 a claim to make in light of if that's true, then the whole way we taught we do philosophy today <laughs> is off. The whole thing's off. And the way we do literature is off because we hermetically seal these things from each other. Right. Like literature is all about, you know, uh, creativity and imaginative, um, you know, constructions, which, you know, depending on which English departments you're talking about are be- being deconstructed. Whereas philosophy is all about uh, sort of rational asking of questions. But Plato is giving us only literary dialogues in which he wants to show us that philosophy, that, that muthos and logos are fundamental to human flourishing. And we've got to see how they're united in our lives. Oh, this uh, whole conversation here is reminding me of, you sent me uh, some information about uh, what uh, version of Plato's Republic I should read. And I was really happy that you said the Alan Bloom one, because that was the one that I had. And um, <clears throat> I had not read Alan Bloom's version. I'm slogging my way through it now. It's beautiful. Um, and I'm, I'm taking this quote that I want to read to you, and I want, to, I want you to respond to this if you can, um, from the essay at the end, his famous essay at the end. And what you're saying reminds me of this quote. He says, The Republic is Plato's defense of philosophy. The philosopher studies nature, particularly the heavens, and there he finds a true account of the celestial phenomena differing widely from that given in the religious myths. For example, he learns of a purely mechanical explanation of Zeus's thunderbolt. The philosopher's contemplation of the heavens dissolves the perspective of the city, the laws of which now seem to be mere conventions with no natural status. His way of life turns him from the duties of citizenship, and what he learns teaches him to despise the human political things. What is more, the philosopher's understanding of the causes of all things makes it impossible for him to grasp man on his own level. Man is reduced to non-man, the political to the sub-political. The philosophers are alienated from the human things, which only poetry can reproduce. And I could go on with that uh, beautiful yeah. essay, but I'll stop it there. Yeah. Um, how, yeah. how, do you res- how do you respond to that? It reminds me a lot of what, you, what you're talking about with the cave allegory. Yeah, g- great question, Jordan. And um, Blue- Alan Bloom was, in my view, a, just a beautiful writer, beautiful thinker. Uh, the closing of the American mind yeah. was really my turning point. That changed my life. That towards book. liberal education. Yeah, it, it just it's another story. But um, and so I think his essay in the back. That's why I rec- partly why I recommend his his edition of that book because your listeners may be thinking after this i hope i want to read that book and i remember reading just a dime store translation uh after on my own after i'd read blooms uh close the american mind i didn't know he had a translation yeah. and it was very difficult i really just did not know what was going on <laughs> it's very hard you, you can't That's just me. say <laughs> say read this book and uh you'll be changed it takes a lot of patience, and yeah. I think it takes some direction and guidance. And so Bloom gives you that. It's a real gift, uh, his addition. That being said, Bloom has a conception of philosophy that I think is controversial and somewhat pivotal. So pivotal in the sense that um, it, 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 it forces you to sort of make a decision one way or another how you think about the achievements of philosophy. If you read the closing of the American mind between the lines, um, it, it's funny that the book was really embraced by evangelicals when it came out um, as a kind of defense of, of what they held to be true. And there's a lot to that. But if you read between the lines and closing the American mind, uh, what you see is that what the philosopher, what Bloom's philosopher ultimately discovers is that his particular life is meaningless and that the cosmos is indifferent to human life. That 
uh, a personal God is unlikely. Certainly a relational God is unlikely. That arguably elements of the mechanistic view of nature in the world are true. And so the philosopher ends up, what, what characterizes the philosopher is not any acquired insight into uh, what is true, good, and beautiful, but just a kind of pleasure of erotic desire to know and you know, to, to pursue the big questions and at least just to know that they're not deceived by the myths. Right. And so that's clearly not the Plato that, say, the church fathers pick up on or that the Neoplatonists pick up mm, on. Right. And so th this is just kind of a question to pay attention to. No, nor is that my Plato, though I think... I can see how Bloom could read Plato this way. I, I don't... I, I think it's a particularly Nietzschean way of reading Plato. Right. That that makes uh, a lot of sense, because what I get from that passage is he is saying the philosopher is one who is able to see through the, the myths. There's someone who is able to see through the mythos. And but, but my question for Bloom is, well, what then? What next? And for Nietzsche, exactly. it's, it's, well, okay, fine, but how do I create my own values? Right. That's, that, that, so we, you know, we could do a whole podcast on Alan Bloom, and, and it would be fruitful. But for, for all of Bloom's incredibly rich insight, I think at the end of the day, he has um, something of an agnostic, uh, po possibly Nietzschean read on Plato. Now, my view is that doesn't have to uh, undermine all the great insights and things that just you know, that just leap off the page yeah. of, of Bloom's essay. Of and by the way, that does I don't think that sullies his interpretation either, his translation, I mean. Uh, that is, Bloom's view is, what he tries to do is to be accurate and consistent in his translation. So the same words, he translates the same way mm -hmm. each time. He tries to avoid using idiomatic expressions uh, in the translation, and then he adds footnotes to sort of say what the words are that he's translating. And so you feel like he's, as much as possible, trying to remove himself from the translation. He's not trying to assert, through his translation, his own philosophy, uh, I don't think. But I guess what I would say is that, um, on the one hand, there, there's something hugely important about what Plato's doing in the Republic. The, the, the poet that rules the Republic is Homer with Hesiod as well. And uh, what Socrates seems to be arguing is Hesiod and Homer are not very good poets for human flourishing because look at how they depict the gods. Uh, the gods are fighting with each other, having sex with each other, having adultery, right. having, you know, uh, fornicating with human beings, starting wars. These are just not very godlike gods. Right. And insofar as human beings imitate the highest things, um, these are not good models. Nor are their heroes good models. Look at what Achilles does. He's, you know, he gets grumpy, he, uh, he abandons his people because uh, he thinks he's been slighted, and then when uh, Patroclus gets killed, what does he do? He slays Hector and drags his body around yeah. for three days with a chariot. That's yeah. not very good. He's, you know, th this is a song about the anger of Achilles, and Achilles just probably is not a good model for a hero. So what we need is a mythos which tells the truth about the gods. That's what he says. And some of the truths that he suggests should be there are uh, God never lies. Uh, and he, he never says whether God exists or not, I don't know. He just said, he assumes God exists the whole time. I think he uh, argues, he, he argues in places that gods must exist. And they're not going to be lying gods. Uh, he even suggests that there must be one God, multiple God. He hints at that, that, that having plural gods in some way is incompatible with divinity. So, you know, my sense is that you can te that, that that you can make that Socrates that Plato makes a lot more sense. To me, he makes a lot more sense if he's understood in a more pious and theological way 
than in Bloom's more nihilistic way. Um, th th but that's, again, a long, longer conversation. I'm inclined to think that the, that the church fathers are understanding Plato in this respect more accurately than Bloom is, though I do think that maybe they take the Neoplatonism a little too far. And so if you have time for one last question, I'd, I'd love to just uh, round this interview out by asking you, what do you think that Plato, that reading Plato, the, the early dialogues and, and reading Plato's Republic, and maybe you could extend this out to philosophy in general, what, what would reading Plato help us with today? Um, how, how could Plato help us in our contentious political climate? Um, what would Plato say about our academy? Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, obviously that that's a great question too. You're asking good questions, very Platonic questions, Socratic <laughs> questions, which means they need a they need books mm. to be answered adequately. Right. One thing that immediately comes to my mind is that reading Plato reminds us of the pleasure, richness of transpolitical things. I think one of the dangers of our time is over politicization. Yes. We are, we are so yes. caught up in and anxious about winning and losing and and fighting and try trying to win out our inch of ter political territory that we forget that politics is not an end in itself, it's at the service of something greater than politics, the trans-political. Right. And, and I think also we Americans, Plato saw this, the danger of democracy, yes. uh, is that we are, equality makes us very anxious about uh, our ability to provide for ourselves and others. It, sim it simultaneously makes us proud because no one is sort of naturally better than us, but it also makes us very anxious because uh, now the sort of nets that we might have relied on once to sort of support us are gone. We've got to do it all ourselves. So we've got this anxious, what I'm talking about here is really the sort of anxious drive that Americans have to work, right? Yep. To, to pursue useful careers, to make money, yeah. to be successful and let's be honest these things when we when we give them when we obsess about them they make us deeply unhappy yes i just saw in the paper yesterday that suicide rates had gone up i think again yes they in have america for the second year in a row yep. and that that's a stunning piece of data right you've got the one of the wealthiest most prosperous countries in the world and people are killing themselves more often and life expectancy Why? has gone gone down again for the second year it, in a row exactly well, a lot of that has to with has to do with opioid abuse and, yeah, yeah. and these other things but again that just begs the question why why are we uh doing this and uh there are lots of reasons they're complex but i think uh plato reading plato reminds us of the good of leisure leisure is not just hanging out not working I mean the leisure of pursuing what is truly rich and meaningful that we yes. hunger for. So he does that, just on the face of it, it's just rich to do that. But I would just say secondly that uh, Plato, in his writing, substantively provides us th a deep knowledge about human nature, about the scope and limits of human longing, human desire, a full picture about our desire for love, about our fear of death, about our, our, our longing for transcendence, about the limits of the body, these things that we just don't want to pay any attention to, do, you know, to today. They're just sort of off our field, but they're so present to us, right? In our experience, yeah. we don't have any fora, we don't have any means for thinking about and making sense of and talking about the things that are so deeply present in us. We all want to love and to be loved. We all fear death in some way we all are insecure so we're just sort of we're all a mess of anxious longing and <laughs> yeah. plato can help us understand that in a really deep way 
Okay, thank you very much for being on the program. That was great, uh, Dr. Schluter. And I hope that you'll join me again. I would love to have that discussion about Bloom um, or if there's any other uh, area of expertise that you have. I'd love to have you on again. Thank you for having me on and thank you for all your good work and thank you for promoting Hillsdale (laughs) and the, the other good places you're promoting and for promoting study of the great books which i think is wonderful so i really appreciate that anytime come back soon thank you thanks thanks jordan take care bye-bye okay so what a fun and edifying interview a lot to chew on there i imagine that's probably what it's like to study at hillsdale college Speaking of fun and edifying interviews, I'd like to include a 35-minute segment from an interview I did with Spencer Clavin on the topic of Plato and Christianity. This is Spencer's third appearance on the Western Canon podcast. He might as well set up a tent in my living room. And I love having him on because, much like his father, Andrew Clavin, Spencer is so eloquent and so good at explaining complex ideas and doing so in a way that reflects on the culture and what, what matters in life. This interview segment is part of a larger interview I did with Spencer on Christianity in general, and we included the discussion of Plato in there. And you can watch several other lively clips from that interview on our website, www.westerncanonpodcast.com. I decided to only really include the stuff on Plato um, in this uh, here episode number nine. So who is Spencer Clavin? Spencer Clavin earned his undergraduate degree in classics and theater studies at Yale University, where he performed as a Yale Wiffenpoof before going to Oxford to complete a master's degree in classical languages and literature. Spencer is now completing his doctorate, focusing on the relationship between words and melody in Hellenistic scholarship. In fact, he told me he already submitted his thesis. Spencer's research explores the ways in which Greek musical and literary theorists describe the interaction of tune and language to create meaning. Spencer is also a teacher, lecturing on a variety of subjects related to ancient Greek literature, including Euripides and Plato. He spoke about Euripides earlier on this podcast, if you want to check out episode number six, as well as Homer, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Herodotus, and Pindar. He also teaches the syntax and morphology of the Greek language. Spencer has published articles for The Federalist, The LA Times, Philosophy Now, PJ Media, among other outlets. You can access some of these articles at our website under the tab labeled Links. How does Plato come to influence um, Christian thought, Christian theology? Great, yeah. So... Um, from the philosophical perspective, there are kind of a number of big, you might call them big questions in theology that um, ultimately boil down to big questions in philosophy. Um, From my perspective, the one that matters most, Ray Plato, is this question of the relationship between the body and the soul. Um, And that is really, in some ways, a kind of crucible boiled down question of the relationship between matter and spirit or earth and heaven or whatever, however you want to call it, right? There's sort of, I mean, the word that gets used a lot is dualism because we're talking about sort of two kinds of thing. Um, and throughout the history of philosophy, there's been a general kind of intuition that these two things exist, that there are, you know, there's stuff, there's tables and chairs and wood and, uh, whatever other material facts there are of the world. And then there's also souls and love and desire and and memories and dreams. Yeah. All that stuff. Right. Exactly. And that don't seem to quite have a material being in the same way that tables do. Um, And even there are concepts like table, which although they have physical instantiations, aren't really themselves physical. Um, So I thought maybe one way to start would be to read, I've got a passage here that I I pulled up from the Phaedo, um, which you'll be familiar with, this Platonic dialogue. Um, And this is a really important passage for for Christians and really for anyone reading uh, Plato. So I'll just briefly read a a part of it. Um, this This is my own translation, but probably you'll get the same thing in any section. So it's a dialogue as, as all of Plato's works are, um, between Socrates, the great teacher, and um, Cedes, who is one of his sort of... And this is your translation. This is me. This is me translating. Awesome. Yes. Um, uh, Socrates says, Now then, essence itself, 
to which we give the designation of being, isn't it always in the same state, in the same regard, or in different states at different times? So is it the same all the time, or does it change? The equal itself, the beautiful itself, each thing which is in itself, that which is, do they ever take on any kind of change? And CB's answer is, they must always remain, Socrates, in the same state. And then Socrates goes on and he says, and what about the many beautiful things like humans or horses or articles of clothing or any other things of that kind, like equal things or everything else like that? Do they remain in the same state or entirely opposite to the essences? Are they never the same themselves, nor as one another, nor in a word in any way with respect to anything? And CB says that second account is right. They are never in the same state. So we're dealing here with this kind of setting up of two different realms, right? And, and ultimately, this probably traces back to an earlier philosopher called Parmenides. Um, this idea of uh, taught ani in Greek, which means being, the sort of existence or being, um, and togignestai, which is to become or to change or to change shape and form. Um, and there's a kind of recognition that there are these stable things like ideas, the equal itself, the beautiful itself, um, concepts. Ultimately, these are going to get called forms, right? Capital F forms. Um, and then there's these things in the world which seem to have some kind of relationship to those essences, like we see beautiful things. Um, but they're not stable. They don't stay the same. They sort of change all the time. Um, and one of the earlier pre-Socratics, I'm sure you're talking about Heraclitus, is sort of known for having said everything, everything is, like, is everything is just flux. changing all the time, right? Yeah, everything is in flux. Um, and basically, Plato in the, with Socrates as a mouthpiece is trying to say here, nope, there are things which stay the same forever. They are eternally themselves. Um, and the rest of the world that we, the kind of material world that we see and touch and feel around us, that is only kind of participating in or partaking of the real stable stuff. Um, and so then he goes on and he says, um, Socrates says, aren't those things that you can touch and see and perceive by the other senses, whereas the things which remain in the same state cannot be grasped by any other faculty than the logical faculty of the mind, but are invisible and unseen. And CB says, yeah, absolutely. So, so basically what Socrates is saying here is this world, this changing world of things that are always different, is what we see around us, and we, we have access to it through the senses. We can touch it and feel it. Um, and that's where we see the human body, for example, is in this world we can touch and feel. But this sort of stable, eternal, ideal world, we can only see through the mind. We can only use our logic and our reason to grasp it. Um, and that's where the soul lives. And so from passages like this, you get this dualism between the physical world and the human body, which we can see right in front of us, and then the soul, which we have to kind of reason our way to or see with this inner eye of, of reason in the mind. Um, okay, so great for Christians on some in some respects, right? Christians agree that there is a soul, that not everything is just matter, it's just stuff. Um, and many Christians agree that we see the soul with not with our tangible sight or with our uh, hands, but but that we sort of experience it with our mind or, or with reason and thought. Um, the question then becomes, what's the relationship between them? Right? I mean, Plato uses this word participate. And he says that, well, when you see a beautiful horse, that's this material thing participating in the form of beauty, the abstract form of beauty. And we sort of reason our way by seeing a lot of beautiful things. We can kind of get our way to reasoning towards what is the beautiful. Descartes um, thought it was the uh, pineal gland, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. So, I mean, certain people have tried to – and that, I mean – these days, right, we can't say that anymore because we basically mapped the brain. Yeah. We, we think that like, um, but right, I mean, for a while there were there were material ways that we thought we could access this. Um, but if it's the case that we have to kind of reason our way out of matter, to kind of climb up, Plato talks at one point about a ladder out of the material world, um, and we just get into this kind of ethereal, floaty, jelly world where everything is stable and permanent and beautiful forever, um, then we have this problem of sort of, well, what's, what is the soul doing in the body? I mean, for Plato, the, the soul is often sort of, again, Plato talks a lot in the images, the soul is sort of encapsulated or, or imprisoned in the body. Um, in the Timaeus, he talks about, you know, the gods kind of putting the soul into the body and then it gets thrown all out of whack by the material world. Um, and this is, again, I mean, Christians too have this sense that the, the kind of 
spiritual beings, the, the beings that love and desire and, and feel, have been kind of disoriented by the fact that our world, our material world is kind of broken. Um, but we also believe in a God who took on flesh and who has basically redeemed and resurrected the world and will ultimately redeem the whole material world. Um, and so this is one of the big philosophical questions that people raise when they, when Christians come to Plato, right? Um, in the very, very early church, there are a set of people called Gnostics um, who kind of endorse this separation, this distinction between body and soul. And they endorse it so entirely that, that God um, becomes not fully incarnated, um, and you end up with things like Arianism, um, which say that Christ is a kind of, um, well, you end up, first of all, in Gnosticism with, with the kind of spirit of Christ and the body of Christ, and they're really not quite the same. And then Arian says, well, well, Christ is basically a kind of demigod or a messenger from God the Father. Um, and neither of those is quite what, quite what Christians are saying. Christians are saying, no, this person was born who was God. And so the, the body and the soul are, are capable, at least, of being in this intimate union. Um, and Platonists, later Platonists, kind of some, run the risk sometimes of rejecting the body and not, not paying attention to the kind of the here and now, because they're trying, they're out in these sort of airy philosophical speculations. I mean, one of the visions of Socrates in, in the symposium is that he spends his time kind of wandering around just staring at the sky because he's seeing the form of the beautiful. And that's great. But I mean, Christians believe in radical justice here and now, right? And, and here's Christ going around mixing up mud with spit and putting it on people's eyes. And so how do you square those two things? Um, and that's that's to set up the question. I think we can talk as we go maybe into the historical stuff about how people have answered that question. But really, I mean, that's that's what's on the table is this this world of being and the world of the mat matter and spirit and how they're related to one another. OK, so one question that that kind of emerges out of that really curious about this. Um, I see a bit of a contradiction here. If what it means to be human is to be fallen and imperfect and subject to change and decay and um, sin and to be in some sense naturally, inherently, innately sort of Hobbesian, greedy and licentious and, and lustful and uh, all of this, um, how can there be a perfect form or ideal of a human being? Right. Yeah. Well, one of the things that is true in, in, on this point is that Christians don't believe that this is a, a permanent or an eternal uh, feature of the human person. Christians believe that everything God makes is good and that any evil is effectively a kind of falling away from or a failure to be what God has made. Oh, so this is um, man is made in the image of God. That right. idea. Yeah. And this is a hugely important part of the Christian interpretation of the gen of Genesis 1 and 2, the story of the creation of Adam and Eve, the first people, and their eating of the fruit, which uh, basically caused them, as it were, to fall. That is a disobedience. You know, God commands them, don't eat this, the fruit of this tree. They go off, they're convinced by, in Hebrew, the nachash, which is, has, comes to be the serpent. Uh, some sort of being convinces Eve to disobey God. And at that point, the Christians believe that humankind kind of enters into a, a relationship of disobedience with God. Um, and usually the language that then gets used is the language of return. So it's not so much that, uh, and this is why Plato causes a problem, right? It's not so much that we are inherently at just qua material beings with souls, we're inherently kind of out of whack. It's that there's some kind of relationship between the divine soul and the material person that was supposed to be perfect from the beginning and now has kind of gotten out of whack. And again, you know, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. We kind of feel this. We sense that, you know, Paul says, I want to do something, but I do the opposite. And we all have this weird relationship with our bodies where we, you know, we, we know we aspire to certain things, but we don't always feel able to do them. We might aspire to a workout routine and then not get up in the morning. Um, and so we feel on this deep level, this sense of disconnect between the physical and the spiritual. Um, and a, a really sort of neoplatonist that is a hard kind of dualist might say, well, that's just what it is to have a body, right? Bodies suck. They, they just drag the soul down into the muck out of the perfect, airy perfection of their reality. Um, but that's not really the Christian attitude. The Christian attitude is no, like this, 
was created good, this thing which is a human being, this kind of mixture of clay, of Adam, and literally mud or, or dust, this mixture of that, and the um, nshama, the divine breath is the Hebrew word, right? This was kind of meant to originally be one thing in harmony. Um, and that harmony was broken when we used our free will to kind of go off the beaten path. Um, but that's basically what Christ is supposed to to reconcile, is by, by becoming the kind of perfect instantiation of, of God in flesh. Um, he shows us the way to be what it is that we were always supposed to be. So the long that's a long-winded way of saying, for Christians, it wasn't always supposed to be like this. So uh, another question then that I have is that how can, how can human beings uh, mm. have access to the perfect Platonic ideal? How, how if, if I am a... If I am a fallen creature with a body, um, how 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 do I have access to what I'm supposed to be? Right? Um, if if the body is an imperfect copy of the perfect Platonic ideal, how do I how do I access what I'm supposed to know so that I can bring myself in uh, closer to the ideal? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll give you the I'll give you the Platonist answer and then I'll give you the Christian Platonist answer and uh, we'll go from there. The the Platonist answer is, is sort of what I articulated from the symposium. There's a, a famous speech by the, the priestess Diotima in that dialogue. Um, and that's where the image of the ladder comes up. And basically what what is said there is, look, we live in this changing, broken, weird world. But even this world kind of participates in the eternal and we know this because we, we see the beautiful in front of us. We see beautiful people and beautiful things and beautiful clothing and all this stuff. Um, but it's all kind of mixed up and concatenated. And, and we don't really have a true sense of what the beautiful is until we look at all of this stuff using our senses. We experience all these beautiful things. And then we do a, we perform a kind of process of abstraction. You know, we say, what is it that's, that's common to all of this stuff? How, you know, how is this? beautiful political system, this good political system, the same as this beautiful person. And how is that the same as what does it share with this beautiful horse, you know, and what does it mean to be good or beautiful? And ultimately, I mean, and this is something that Plato begins very early on in his career in the Euthyphro, you know, how do we get, get to like the essence of the thing itself? And that is the process of reasoning and climbing that sort of lets us ultimately just gaze with the eye of the mind upon the beautiful. Um, there's a, that's a very kind of, you might call it a humanist approach, although ultimately behind it, it's got a kind of idea of God kind of put the logos, the, the spark of reason into us from, from the beginning. Um, but we in that model are kind of sufficient to climb our way out. Um, for someone like Augustine, who is an early church father who basically endorses this view of, of a kind of material world and a spiritual world, broadly speaking, um, there still has to be some kind of divine intervention to enable us to do this kind of intellectual. And, and when I say intellectual, it sounds very thinky, but it's, you know, you might also say spiritual, this kind of use of our, um, the use of our mind, our non-sensory uh, perception to, to see the divine. Um, this is the doctrine of illumination in Augustine, that, that effectively we have help um, that God has has basically instilled in us some uh, sense which is able still to to work its way out um, of of this broken world to sort of see or intuit or have a, a half sense of, of where we're going. Um, and that is, and for many people, that's the, the process of discernment. Um, and in fact, this goes all the way back to the Gospels and the Gospel of John, right? That it said that Christ is the true light which lightens everyone that comes into the world. Um, and this idea that, you know, for everybody, not even just for Christians, for everybody, there is this kind of uh, divine illumination um, that kind of guides us on on the way. So it's not so much that we're blind as that we're like, I have really, really, really bad vision. You know. So this, this reminds me of two things that I want you to touch on. The first thing right. that it uh, calls to mind is Plato's cave allegory. And then the second, right. the, the light, obviously, and, and being a prisoner in a cave and um, not seeing the world the way that it really is and escaping from that um, illusory sort of, um, you know, uh, idealistic, subjective picture of the world and and emerging into the light of uh, the, the way things really are. 
Um, but also it calls to mind the idea of the the logos, which which you touched on, right? And so if I if I have this right, um, the logos, from what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, is the word of God. It's the divine reason. It's the order. It's the truth that God speaks, and this brings order into chaos. Uh, gives the cosmos form, right? Structure, meaning, um, and then uh, and then Christians. And here's where I might be off. Christians believe that Christ is the word of God made flesh, right? Mm -hmm. Who then reveals Mm -hmm. God's plan uh, of salvation to the world, to man. And then there's a sense in which man is made in God's image and is to some degree a manifestation of the logos. Correct. Correct me where I've gone off the rails. Okay. Wow. Well, you, you know, you've got it. Basically, I would would mostly endorse what most of what you said. Um, Let's start with your first question and and we'll move on from there. Um, The allegory of the cave is a famous, but rightly famous uh, section of Plato's Republic in which he basically gives an image for this kind of discernment that, that I was talking about. Um, Basically the image is that we poor benighted people are uh, trapped chained in a cave most of us don't even know we're there we think we're out in the real world of light is the cave um, are fact, is the cave my body my imperfect bag of flesh uh, in which my spirit is housed is it my imperfect naive subjectivity that that does mm-hmm. not view as kant would say things in themselves or as buddhists would say things from their own side mm, yeah um, like both that? of those are both of those are apt comparisons. I mean, I, I, I think that the cave, so one question that a, a reader of Plato might have is whether it's true that we have to give up our bodies to get out of the cave. Um, later readers of Plato will, will basically suggest that, but it's not clear that that's what Plato thinks. So the cave is either our body itself, out of which we must descend sort of intellectually, um, or it's just our current world and the state of our world as it is now. Um, but certainly outside is the sun, which is effectively Kant's noumenal world, as you were saying, or it's things from their own side, um, the truth of the way things are. And the sun is projecting light into the cave just a little bit. Um, And then there are people, perhaps gods, with um, shadow puppets, basically, puppets that against which the light hits. And what we see in the world is are those shadows. So just yeah, it kind of echoes of an echo, you know, these, these um, little forms, I mean, not platonic forms, but just images of, of what is representation. Really true. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Representation. And, yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Um, and one of the remarkable things about the cave is that Plato suggests that through some totally unknown mechanism, the only way for us to get out is for somebody to go up into the light and see the light. And eventually, as his eyes adjust, he'll see what's really true. And then if he were to come back down, Plato says, and tell the story or tell what's there and explain that this is a cave and the truth is out there, he would be torn limb from limb. They would dismember. hate him. They would get mad at him. him. <laughs> so this is the story of Christ. It's this, right. I mean, this is why one of the reasons why Plato is often characterized not just as an important philosopher, but as the divine Plato or even a, a kind of secular prophet. I mean, Dante famously in the Divine Comedy, this vision of going down into hell. Um, he's a, a, a kind of Christian who believes that everybody who hasn't heard of Christ is in hell. But he puts Plato kind of on, in this like waiting room outside of hell. It's not quite, you know, like a lot, a lot of the um, and, and Virgil is his guide through hell. So, so this I mean, this sense that the um, the Greek philosophers, the great Greek philosophers kind of had their noses pressed up against the glass of what would eventually be revealed in Christ is very palpable in that cave allegory. Well, that's oh, a great and, image and, for us. Right. It's perfect. Yeah, it, it really um, works beautifully. We should then talk about the Logos, which is actually not unrelated. So. Um, Logos, let's start here. Logos is a Greek word. It is um, untranslatable. It means many different things at different times in English. Um, Some of the best ways to translate it are speech, reason. um, You might even say meaning, uh, but other people also say word, right? So, or language. Um, And the question of how you translate it is related to the question of what you think it is. Um, but ultimately it has something to do with this kind of rational structure, which in Plato, especially in the Timaeus 
undergirds the whole universe. Um, this is related to another philosopher we haven't talked about, Pythagoras, right? Um, th this notion that there's a kind of rationally comprehensible structure at the basis of the whole universe. Math. That Math, right, exactly. Logos, another way of, another word that logos is used to mean is ratio. So the relationship between two numbers. Um, and so from Plato onward, there's this question or this sense, and even before Plato, you know, is the whole universe arranged according to a logos? Is there a, a thread of, of reason and logic and a structure running through? Um, and a number of people answer with an emphatic like, yes, among them the Stoics, who uh, you, I'm sure we'll encounter in a, in a different uh, episode. But the Stoics agree, by and large, with Plato that the whole world is sort of um, logically organized or permeated by a logos um, and, a, and a reason. The Stoics, unlike Plato, are um, corporealists, which is kind of a fancy way of saying they're almost materialists. Mm -hmm. They basically don't believe that there is any, you know, non uh, world that doesn't have to do with bodies. Um, and so their sort of logos is, is a little bit different than Plato's. But but throughout, you have this idea that the logos is, is what um, threads through the entire universe. And because it's such a linguistic word, what that means is that God is kind of communicating through his creation or, you know, the fact of of God's creation has embedded or encoded into it the nature of God or the good or the goodness of God. Um, the place that this becomes important for Christianity is in the first chapter of the gospel, according to John. I mean, not the only place, but John is very interested both in Stoic philosophy, but in kind of the way that this logos is related to Christ. Um, and basically the way it seems to work is that the logos understood as the kind of universal structure of the world as encountered in Plato's Timaeus um, is the second person of the Trinity is the Christ um, and is part of God. It's part of God to be sort of expressing himself in creation in this way. Um, but Jesus, the dude to whom I referred is the kind of encoding of that logos into a human life. So so Christ is then a kind of language that God uses to tell us everything about himself. So even though the whole universe has this logos sort of thread through it, we only live in this little tiny space and time, right? And so what God does in Christ is in some ways to sort of take that whole reason and, and structure and shrink it on down into a person that we can see and talk to and read about and know. Um, and that's kind of how it becomes the case that, that Christ is the illumination or the, the one that sort of communicates to us who God is. Um, and because God is fundamentally, in, in some ways, like us, that is, he um, made us in his image and, and can be expressed in human terms, that works, right? Jesus basically communicates to us. One of the metaphors that I've used is, you know, I was once flying in a plane over a cornfield, and the cornfield had a giant R, the letter R, stamped into it. So some of the stalks of corn had been flattened down, and they were in this shape of an R. And it's sort of like, when you're flying over, you can see that that's true. But if you're just in the cornfield, right, it just sort of looks like, well, some stalks are down, some stalks are up, it's kind of irrational in any mm -hmm. sense. Um, Jesus is the, what it's like to fly up in the plane and see the R inscribed. So that then when you go out back into the world and you say, oh, this is, it just doesn't look rational to me, but actually I know it's just a small part of this massive personality that's being expressed in the world. And that's why when I said to you at the beginning that, you know, I've always encountered this personality in the world, that's what I believe I was encountering was like Jesus writ large. Um, and Jesus in the gospel is this sort of Jesus up close and personal. So when human beings create civilization, when we mm. bring our values, our religions, our um, ideas to bear on humanity, and mm. we live in the right way, and we have a civilization that is just um, mm. to some degree, how is it the case that we've brought, um, that we have harnessed the Logos when God has already spoken the Logos into being, if that's an intelligible question at all? Absolutely it is, yeah. And the person that you would really want to turn to for this is, again, not someone who's, I mean, he's not unrelated to Plato, but is, is closer to Aristotle, and that's Thomas Aquinas, the um, the great Christian philosopher who writes the Summa Theologica in the 1200s. Mm -hmm. um, Aquinas has this whole theory of, of natural law, uh, divine law, and then sort of human law, the law of the, of the world. Um, and that's where you start to ask, well, what's the relationship between human societies, human actions, human persons, and this great transcendent 
order, cosmic order that we see manifested in Christ. Great, here he is there in front of us. How should we now live? Um, and basically the way that this works, at least for me, and I think for other Christians as well, is that what happens when you when you encounter the Logos or, or sort of learn from the Logos in itself is that you experience not only a personhood, but a pattern or a spirit, a kind of way uh, of, of being. And just like a tree, I mean, Jesus uses the language of the kingdom of heaven, like a mustard seed, which grows out into a tree, right? That one set of relationships, that one trinity, um, can have implications that branch out in a million different ways. And one of the reasons why Christ is supposed to basically usher the Gentiles into the uh, the Jewish tradition is that he makes what was originally kind of locked into a culturally contingent uh, individual nation and people, um, makes it a kind of typology or a blueprint that can be then just expanded outward into a million different societies and communities. Um, and so even though we have this kind of eternal word that is forever speaking, we also have these, you know, we still live in the changing, the world of togignesti, the world of changing and, and individual contingencies. And so in this particular moment, how is it that, you know, what the Logos has communicated to us plays out in your life and my life? What do we do in response? Um, and again, one of the things I believe is that I actually can't answer that question for you. I can answer it haltingly in prayer for myself and then in community with others. Um, but what I can tell you is a set of rules that's always going to work for, for acting that out in every place and time. So that is going to have a huge importance on natural rights theory. The idea mm -hmm. that our rights, because that's one of the questions when we're talking about this in school, yeah. one of the questions I get is how in the world is it possible that our rights aren't given to us by government. How does that even make mm -hmm. sense? Kids will ask, you know, isn't it the government that protects our rights? Isn't it, we don't get to use them unless they're given to us by government, right? And then you have to say, no, those rights exist in a state of nature and governments are formed to honor those rights and essentially to help help you have have your right to life, liberty and property. And then you can yeah. talk about lock and mixing your labor with the land and all of this stuff. So um, yeah, yeah. But but this actually extends all the way back into early Christian thought, doesn't it? It it absolutely does, and I think that you know most of the uh, political theories to which you just alluded are steeped in uh, the the kind of Christian attitude towards what the human person is. Um, they're actually, in 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 my own not so humble opinion, like there aren't actually. Uh, Particular, there aren't any particularly good ways of grounding universal rights, except in some sort of theory of divine investment in the human person. I was going to say it's um, hard to conceive of those rights without without that foundation. Exactly, exactly, um, and you know that brings its own inconveniences with it, right? I mean, it means, for example, that if every if every human life, regardless of kind of utilitarian consequences of that life, if every human life is worthwhile and valuable, qua creation of a God who invests his image into it, um, well, then we have to ask serious questions about the taking of human life, for example, in the womb, you know, um, and obviously that's a, a that is a political question with with really kind of thorny and emotional uh, diff raises really thorny and emotional difficulties. Um, but I think that it's it's sort of our only route forward. I mean, we can acknowledge right that there are extreme cases in which um, abortion is presents a really, really sort of difficult questions. But in order to preserve the sanctity of human life, full stop, and the implication in human life of of the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, for example, um, I think we only the only way forward we have is to say, from conception, that's what you are, regardless of whether you are stunted in your growth or um, you know deeply flawed from the eyes of the world. Right? I mean, the, the, this is kind of the one way to ground um, universal rights, essentially. Yeah, and so one of the things that I don't like is when people use those marginal cases to argue the rule. Right. When they when they actually use those marginal cases to say um, that odd, rare occurrence is why we should have this entire regime, this program of of ending life. So um, that said, yeah, it's difficult to con it's difficult without using religious language to talk mm -hmm. about 
you know, because you can be the deists, you can be the founding fathers, and you can say, well, well, of course, like Locke would say, in a state of nature, you have you have a right to your own existence, you have a right to your own life. And then because mm-hmm. you have a right to your life, you need to be able to have certain other natural negative rights, like your right to um, work, a right to your own labor and a right to your own property so that you can uh, work and uh, keep the fruits of your labor and all of this. Right. And you have a right to not have your liberties infringed upon because you have a right to your life and all of this. But it's like, where where is the first mover? Where is the first mover? Yeah. Why, if if you're John Locke, why then do you have a right to life? Right. Without, so. without the tradition that you're describing, how, how mm-hmm. do you even have a right to life? In a state of nature, it seems to me that you don't actually have a right to life. Where does right. that come from? Help me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh, I wish I could. I mean, you know, <laughs> um, I mean, uh, without a theological i mean we should be clear right that we, we've left christian territory here we've left uniquely christian territory and we're talking purely about theistic theism right i mean um you don't need to believe what i believe about the person of jesus christ right. to believe that there is a creator god who invests infinite value in the humans that he creates um without that though it is very difficult to find a grounding for um human value that is a priori that is to say you can you can argue for the right. value of human people uh who produce things for example or who are capable eventually of producing things um but even those values imply that those things would have value as having been produced and why because they benefit humans which must mean that again somewhere at the back of that is just a naked assertion of human life and human flourishing is of worth um once you say that you are positing that as just a kind of one of the premises one of the, the facts of the universe um the problem with asserting that anything is of worth per se is that it immediately raises the question of worth to whom, right? Worth is something which only really takes shape or exists in relationship to a consciousness. And so if you've said that human beings are just of worth full stop, um, then you've suggested that in that full stop place, in that place without any pre-existing conditions or other human beings, if there were only one person, that person would be of worth. Well, you have to ask, to whom, right? And so you really ultimately do need a, a, a divine consciousness, some kind of perceiving being to say, human beings, that's it. They matter. You know, they have they have worth. And again, you know, the implications of that are are up for debate. We can we can talk about you know whether that means that you have a, a right to a gun or not. Um, and I happen to think that it does, but that's many many steps down the line. Nevertheless, the the concept you're right of, of natural rights is. Um, I, I can't offer you a secular grounding for it because I don't believe that one exists. All right, another great interview. Hope to have him on the show again, maybe when we discuss the Bible or Aristotle. So that's it for this episode. Be sure to tune in to our next episode on Plato. It will be called Plato's Republic, Part 2, and it will include commentary from our Western canon correspondent, Gina Santiago. I'd like to say thank you to our guests, Dr. Nathan Schluter and also Spencer Clavin. As always, thanks for listening and happy reading. <laughs>